Um, we are going to finish up today the parable of the shrewd manager, which is uh, Luke 16, uh, 1 through 18. And before we get back into it this morning, uh, there were a few things I wanted to go over from, from last week. One was I, I felt like I made quite a bit of the fact that this parable was really difficult and uh, how complicated it was and et cetera, but I don't want to discourage anyone from feeling like um, we are able to obviously interpret God's word and be able to understand. We are able to understand, and some things in the Bible obviously are more, a little more challenging than others, but please don't let what I say discourage you from diving in and trying to understand some of the things that you read. Also, I received some feedback from our, our first class, and I just wanted to let all, those of you who provided that, that know that I appreciate the, the positive feedback and the encouragement, and also some of the different ideas that were presented to me, and I'm still considering some of those things, so thank you for that. So what I would like to do today is kind of review a few things before we get to the slide that we left off on. And I actually want to expand on a, a couple of ideas that I went over last week, but I want to dig into those a little bit deeper just because I think it's critical to understanding the concept of the, of the parable, what Jesus is talking about. So I, I, want to, I want to dive into that a little bit more. And uh, I used to, I don't, still getting to know a lot of you guys, but I used to play in a band. I play, I'm a guitar player. And we used to, me and the, one of the guitar players before a show, we'd always joke around with each other that we were going to melt people's faces off that night, right? We were going to play these screaming guitar solos and whatever. So this morning, I promise to leave your face intact, but I'm going to be melting your brain, hopefully. So we got a lot to go through. I'm going to really try to articulate the thoughts and, and connect them all because there really is a lot going on here. So i um, definitely going to get through everything today. If you have questions after class, more than happy to, to talk to you about that and go through any of those, uh, anything that we discuss. Hopefully I can connect all the dots for you and this will be, uh, be all easily understood. So we'll jump right in then. Um, the parable of the, the shrewd steward, the, we talked about last week, there's a rich landowner, there's a manager who's in charge of this man's estate. The, in the very first verse, there's a, the manager is accused of squandering. The Bible uses the word squandering the rich man's possessions away. And we talked about the fact that the word that is used in the parable in Luke 16, the word squandering is the same word that's used in Luke 15 in the parable that's told just before the, with the parable of the prodigal son. So the word squandering was used in both places. So I want to, this is one of the things I want to expand on a little bit because I think this, this concept is important. So the word squander... I think, I think all of us probably understand what the word squander means, but the definition is to spend or use money or time extravagantly or wastefully. Um, an extravagant or a wasteful expenditure. And like I said, I think, it, you know, that's a word most of us understand, but there's some implications that go along with using that specific word that I want to talk about. So, um, so I know what each one of you is thinking here. This is a perfect time for me to talk about MC Hammer, right? You all expected that. All right, I'm very, uh, I'm very predictable. So, MC Hammer, we're going to date ourselves here. Um, how many of you guys heard of him, MC Hammer, from back in the day? Yeah, we're all old. Amanda, you never heard of MC Hammer. You did? Really? Wow, okay. My daughter looked at me like a deer in headlights. Who is that? Deer in headlights. Um, okay, so MC Hammer, obviously, you know, 80s or mid-80s, somewhere in there, maybe the early 90s. Um, up-and-coming artist, rapper, whatever. And uh, this guy went from literally selling CDs in the back of his car to multi-million dollar record deal and um, ended up amassing a fortune that was worth about $33 million. That's, that's pretty significant, right? Most of us are never going to see $33 million. We could probably combine all of us and be lucky to see $33 million. This one guy amassed a fortune of $33 million. Well, I, I saw a, um, a documentary on him one time, 
where they were talking about how he had gone dead broke. And I think it, most people know that about him too. That's one of the, the headlines that always accompanies MC Hammer is all his huge success and then, and then his demise where he lost, ended up losing it all. Well, I saw a documentary on him way back in the day. And, and one of the things they were talking about was how this guy, uh, because he had you know, come into all this money or whatever, he bought a mansion and was doing things like buying uh, Italian marble countertops that were imported from this specific spot in Italy, you know. So he'd have a, a, a sink in one of his guest bathrooms that was worth $58,000 or something, you know. And, and literally, the master bathroom, uh, he talked about how he had gold um, faucets, gold hardware on his faucet. And not gold-plated, you know, not the stuff you and I might have in our house. I'm talking real gold faucets right gold hardware on his sinks well obviously it doesn't take a a, a, a money expert to know that if you're buying gold faucets and you know specific you know things that are materials that are that expensive it's just extravagant it's over the top it's completely unnecessary that's what squandering is right you're you are spending intentionally spending extravagantly all of your money and this, of course, ended up costing him, costing him everything. In fact, he not only lost his $33 million, he ended up going $13 million in debt and eventually had to sell his, his mansion and everything else. And he actually filed for bankruptcy, which is uh, kind of hard for, hard for a lot of us to believe. Not, not judging the guy, I don't, you know, whatever he was going through. But, but the point is he squandered away his fortune. So there's, there's a few, few ideas here. Oh, and one of the things I did think was interesting, too, I read an article, I was just kind of refreshing my, my memory on this last night, and uh, read an article about it again. And one of the things he said was that back then, he had his priorities all messed up. He said, I should have had God, family, community, and then business for my priorities. Should have had God first. And admittedly, he didn't. And because of that, he squandered all this money away. So even a... a he's, I would call him a, a religious man. Um, I don't, I don't know what his beliefs are in particular, but anyway, he's he's able to recognize that had he put God first, then probably his situation would be considerably different. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But the so the the pieces of that though, that are that correlate to the parable of the prodigal son, the squandering part. MC Hammer's story, the squandering. First of all, what I want to what I want to look at there is this was a choice that that was intentionally made. This was a conscious decision that was made on the part of MC Hammer, on the part of the prodigal son, and on the part of the shrewd manager, which we'll look at in a minute. This wasn't something that you know, MC Hammer woke up one day and realized that he accidentally spent all this money. I mean, he, he wanted those gold faucets. He said in the, in the, in the, uh, the interview, you know, he wanted all these nice things. He wanted that stuff. It's a choice that he made. And that's, that's part of what I want you to, to wrap your mind around for the word squandering is that it's, it's intentional. It's not accidental. This was something that, that he planned to do. Now, when we look at in Luke 15, if you turn with me there, oh, and I, I should have told you for the whole first part of this, I didn't go through and create all the slides because I just, we're going to be uh, just covering this, the same stuff. But <clears throat> so in Luke 15, uh, chapter, excuse me, Luke chapter 15, verse 11, when you look at the, the parable of the prodigal son, the Bible says, and uh, so this is uh, starting at the beginning of the parable. And he said, a man had two sons, the younger of them said to, the man had two sons, the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. And then in 14, it says, now when he had spent everything, et cetera, et cetera. So. First of all, why do you think that the prodigal son asked for his inheritance in the first place? Why did he want it up front? He planned to spend it, right? That, uh, he, he was looking to get everything that he was going to have coming to him. He wanted to get it all at once right now 
because he wanted to go spend it. He wanted to go travel and do whatever he was going to do. Um, it says in, in verse 13, not many days after he got his inheritance, he gathered all his stuff together and left. There's, a, there's an intentional, there's a choice that the prodigal son had made prior to ever even asking for his inheritance that he wanted to go do these things. And he did them. He followed through and he did them. And as a result of those choices, in verse 14, he ended up spending everything. So it was a choice that the prodigal son made. Hang on to that idea because we're going to look at that same idea with the manager. So when we go to Luke 16, as we already said, it's the same exact word that's used in the, the, product, the parable of the prodigal son. So my question is, who is in charge in the parable of the shrewd manager? So we're changing back to Luke 16. Who is in charge of the, the rich man's possessions in that parable? It was the manager, right? The manager was in control of that money. Who was the one that was doing the squandering? It was the, the manager, right? The rich man wasn't squandering his own stuff, and nobody else was squandering that away. Who was the one that made the choice to squander? The manager, right? The manager is the one that made this choice. So who is at fault here for squandering? The manager, right? There's ownership involved with that word squandering. And the manager... In this case, the manager is the one who was squandering away the possessions that he was in charge of. My point is this, two, two things. One is that Jesus is painting a picture here that the manager is the one who misused or mismantled his, mishandled his master's possessions. Now, what am I using to justify this? First of all, the use of squander. Um, he could have said the manager accidentally lost or mistakenly or you know whatever he could have said whatever but he squandered it there's ownership there and we're going to see a little bit later in verse 8 um, he actually calls the manager unrighteous so if you made an honest mistake and didn't do something intentionally would you be unrighteous can you do something can you make a mistake in how you handle something and does that make you unrighteous the whole between the squandering and the unrighteous we're going to see how that that kind of comes together so another question was the manager squandering away those possessions before or after he was fired kind of a trick question technically both right he, uh, he was obviously squandering them before because the charges were brought against him it was brought to the attention of the rich man which is why the whole thing started in the first place so he was squandering before, but he also squandered them after because he decided once he realized he was going to get fired, he made the decision to pull all the debtors together, right? Remember that in the story? He called, the, called them all to one place. He said, I know what I'm going to do, and he called them all together. So he was squandering them to, before and after. So would the manager have been fired for accidentally squandering his, his master's possessions away? What do you think? Would he have been fired? We're kind of assuming. What was that, Dave? Yeah, probably, right? Would any of us get fired if we screwed up at our jobs? If we did something wrong? Yeah, intentional or not, if you screw up bad enough, you're out the door. And I've, I've seen that firsthand. Um, we're not given the impression, however, in the parable that this was accidental. We're, we're given the impression in the parable that this was intentional. Um, I believe that based on what Jesus says, his, the words that he uses, the, the use of uh, verse 8 where he calls him unrighteous, I think the, the, the manager knew what he was doing. And if you notice, Jesus does not place the blame on anyone else in the parable. Basically, it boils down to the manager. So in verse 4, what does he say in verse 4? 
16, chapter 16, verse 4. Just to kind of bring this point home, the manager says, I know what I shall do. So before he ever pulled these guys together, who made the decision of how that interaction was going to go when he pulled the debtors together? I know what I shall do. So he had a, in his brain what he was going to do, and then he calls all these people together, and then he starts doing what he did. So this was a cognizant choice on the part of the manager. And I, I'll, I'll stop harping on that point, but I, I want that to be in your brain for when we get to the end of this, because we're going to talk about conscious choices that we have to make, and we're going to draw a correlation to that. <laughs> So at the end of the day, who's at fault here? Is a rich man at fault for hiring a guy that was going to treat his possessions that way? Are the debtors at fault for accepting his generosity? The manager's at fault. The manager was responsible to handle the rich man's property. The manager is the one who made the decision to squander away the rich man's possessions. The manager made a conscious choice to continue to squander away the rich man's possessions after he was fired. And he tells us in in the parable the reason that he decided to continue to squander those possessions away. He was looking after himself. He was thinking of himself. He was going to use the resources that had been left in his charge to serve his own needs. He was no longer looking out for the needs. He wasn't looking out for the needs apparently at some point before he was actually had the charges brought against him. But he was also all the way up until the end. Even after he was fired, even after he was let go, he was looking out for himself. This is why I believe in verse 8, Jesus calls, he refers to the manager as the unrighteous manager. This was a man who was consciously thinking to do things that were not in line with what he was trusted to do. What he was expected to do. The expectations of the rich man were for him to... Take care of his possessions. Okay, so I've, I've driven that point home, right? We're all, we're all clear on that. I apologize if that was too long. So the results. Obviously, the manager was fired. So the manager gets told to put his records together um, so that he can turn them over. And that's the point at which he comes up with his plan. So, um, and we learn that the reason for his plan, again, to, to look out for his own needs and the way that the Bible phrases that is so that once he gets let go he will be accepted into their homes that's where we see him discounting the the goods so he can gain their friendship this was a calculated act on his part the second um and then okay excuse me so then at the end of the parable this was another point that i wanted to talk about and clarify a little bit more because this is kind of a not a difficult concept but it's uh it's important is that we see that Jesus ends the parable by telling us that the rich man actually praised him or commended him for his actions, which is kind of backwards of what you would expect. A guy who, if, if, if I was working for my boss and I was squandering away whatever it was I was in, in charge of, and then I got caught and they brought, he brought charges against me and he was obviously convinced enough that he's going to fire me. I don't even put up, you know, according to the parable, I don't even try to defend myself. We don't have any evidence of that. He just says, great, I'm fired, and I'm going to be put out. I would not expect when my boss fired me to praise me for anything, <laughs> quite frankly, right? Get out. You know, it would be that kind of thing is what I, was, what I would expect, is that you would just flat be fired and thrown out. So the, the thing that I want to focus on before we move forward here is, I want to revisit that idea that the manager did not praise him for stealing from him. He praised him, according to the parable, because he acted shrewdly. Now, there's a, there's a difference here. And what we talked about last week and, and the, the spot where I want to be clear that we're um, understanding is that Jesus is not condoning the action. We're not being asked later on in, this, in the, the verses to act exactly like the shrewd manager, right? We don't want to squander away anything. 
we definitely don't want to be deceitful and steal and all that. I think that's, I hope that's pretty obvious. But he's commending him for being shrewdly, for acting shrewd, excuse me. The difference is, first of all, we talked about the word shrewd, and the definition I gave, which is straight out of the dictionary, is that being shrewd is being astute or sharp in practical matters, being prudent, sensible, and wise. And I use the word wise because that is accurate, but I want to be sure that I'm not giving you the impression that we're calling this guy a wise man. Um, One of the things I said last week, and this is true, is that this is the same word that's used when we say that the wise man built his house upon the rock, right? And the wise man that built his house upon the rock, he was wise because he was thinking ahead and he made a good decision by planning and making sure that his house was going to be okay. Well, we're, we're, we are calling what the manager did wise, but only from the point that he was smart enough to consider his future. We're not condoning the action. We're, con- we're just recognizing the cleverness behind how he took care of himself. But that doesn't make it right. Do, are there any other examples in the Bible of individuals that you can think of that we know without a doubt were wise men, but they failed and their actions were incorrect. And because of that, there were consequences. And the first one that popped in my head, there's, I'm sure we could find several, but the first one that popped in my head, and I can see several of you nodding, and I'm sure you're thinking the same thing, is Solomon. Right? Solomon was probably the wisest man that ever walked the earth. Um, we, we know without a doubt based, uh, and let's just, and I'll, I'll turn there real quick and read a couple of things, but in first Kings four twenty nine, and I have several examples here, but I'm just going to read a couple. First Kings four twenty nine. Now God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of mind, like the sand that is on the seashore. God gave him that wisdom. It was something that God specifically gave him. And if you look at 2 Chronicles 1, 11 through 12. Second Chronicles 1, 11 through 12. This is where Solomon had prayed for wisdom and God responds to him and says, God said to Solomon, because you had this in mind and did not ask for riches, wealth or honor or the life of those who hate you, nor have you even asked for a long life, but you have asked for yourself wisdom and knowledge that you may rule my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge have been granted to you. Anyway, my point is there's several verses. First Kings 434, Second Chronicles 922 is where we learn that, or excuse me, let me finish that thought. Um, Solomon was a wise man. This was wisdom that God specifically gave him. So we're talking about a wisdom here, the, you know, the word wise on steroids, right? In Solomon's case, this guy was given specifically from God Almighty the wisdom that he had. Well, even in all his wisdom, according to Second Chronicles nine twenty two, he fell away. He worshipped idols. He he married um, women that he wasn't supposed to. He went directly against what God had taught him. And my point in saying all this is just this. Just because in the parable he, the manager was praised for acting shrewdly doesn't make him wise in the sense that he was correct. Being wise doesn't make you, doesn't mean what he did was right. It just means that he was thinking ahead. And that's the, that's the only part I think that Jesus is drawing to our attention is that he was thinking about his future. So that's all I want you to grab from that is we're not admiring this man for the actions that he did. And in all sincerity, I don't even think we're intended to admire the way that he thought about his future. Only the fact that he thought of his future. And that's relevant in the parable because, as we'll see later, we're going to be admonished to think of our futures. And that's where that's where we left off last week. Okay. So we talked about the problems, the sons of this age, the sons of this light, uh, their own kind in verse eight, where we're referring to all these different things. Um, And then in verse eight, where we're is where we're presented the problem where we see that the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind um, than the sons of light. So we're, we're looking at the shrewdness again. 
And that's where we left off was that the physical future is, is only temporary. And I was wanting everyone to think that your spiritual future is what's permanent. So we pick up in verse 9. And, and this is the part where, so we've been given the whole parable. Verse 8, we're given the problem. Now in verse 9, Jesus is starting to talk to us. He's, talk, he's starting to talk to the Pharisees in what we're reading, but this is where he talks to us. He says, and I say to you, so this is the part that still applies to us. Make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. And this is one of the, the verses that, that I was talking about that can be a little bit difficult to understand. So before we, we get into exactly what all of that means, I want to look at several different correlations here. If you remember from the parable, everything we were talking about the, um, from the manager, we'll see several correlations here. One is in verse 4 when Jesus is talking about the manager. He's talking about when he's removed from management. Once he... Uh, remove, gets removed. And in verse 9, you'll notice he talks about how once it fails. So the idea of once you're removed or you fail, so you're removed. Um, and then he talks about fails. Another one is in verse 4. The manager says he's going to do all these things so that once he does, people will welcome me into their homes. And then in verse 9, in the verse we just read, you'll notice he, Jesus says, do all these things so that they will receive you into eternal dwellings. You see the correlation there? The next one is um, the, the manager says, I know what I shall do. People will welcome me into their homes. So kind of the same thing we just talked about, but the concept being he's making friends, right? He's creating these alliances and developing the uh, relationship so that he has a friend, someone who's going to help him later. And in verse 9, Jesus says, make friends for yourselves. So you can see he's going back to what he said in verse 4. When he comes down to verse 9, he's drawing on what he's already said in the parable, and he's making, starting to make those connections for us. Another thing we want to notice, the manager used his position, his money, the, the riches that he was in charge of. He didn't go to the, the debtors and say, I want you guys to... to welcome me into your homes after I'm fired because I'm a nice guy, because I'm a friendly guy, because I'm funny, because I'm a good cook. He, did, he used, went to their pocketbooks. He used the money to discount their, their goods to gain that friendship. And in verse 9, Jesus tells us, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth. So the manager used the wealth that he was in charge of to gain those friends, quote unquote, not really friends, right? But And in verse 9, he said, Jesus says, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth. Now, why does, why does Jesus call it unrighteous wealth? The word there is mammon. You'll see mammon in, in parentheses there several times because the, the actual word there that's being used is mammon, and, um, which is a word that, that literally translate rich, it translates to riches. I've heard it translated as money, and that's accurate. Um, but there's, there's all these different things. But basically, money is just excuse me, mammon is just a broad word for, for riches. So why does he call it unrighteous? Well, one of the things, if you look at 1 Timothy 6, 9, this is a passage that we're all pretty familiar, for, familiar with, but he's, uh, the passage in 1 Timothy 6, 9 is, is talking about being snared by, basically by, by foolish pursuits um, involving money. In verse 10, the Bible reads that the, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. So Jesus could be just calling it unrighteous wealth or unrighteous mammon because of the dangers here. Um, is it wrong to have money? Is it wrong to be wealthy? Is it, is it, would it be a sin to be a wealthy person financially? No, right? There's plenty of examples in the Bible of, of people who are financially wealthy. In fact, very godly people that were financially wealthy. So just having the wealth is not, is not the problem. It's how you handle it and what you do with it. And I think that, that because of the situation that we're discussing here in the parable, Christ refers to the money as unrighteous. The money itself is not unrighteous. It's how it's being used. So Jesus also says, tells us to make friends for yourselves by means of the mammon. 
So what we see here in the parable is that the, the manager ex, uh, excuses some of the debt to gain the friendship of these people with the intent that down the road he's going to be repaid because he's going to need a place to stay since he's been fired. What we're seeing here is an act of generosity in the eyes of the debtor's mind Hence the reason they would feel compelled to offer their homes to this person when he's in need later. The use of money here is what, what we're seeing is that we should be using our money as a tool for, for use in generosity and that we should take care of those in need. Now I will, I will draw this, I'll make that a little more clear here in a little bit. Um, So in verse 9, he also says, and you focus on the underlying parts there, that we're to make friends by use of this money, etc., so that when it fails, that they will receive you into eternal dwellings. John 14, 1 through 13 do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. My, in my Father's house are many dwellings. This is not the first time that Christ refers to an eternal dwelling or a future dwelling place. And there's a correlation here in John 14 where we can see that Jesus is telling us that there have been some dwelling places that have been prepared for us. And those dwelling places that he's talking about in John are the same ones he's talking about in verse 9, saying that that if you do what you're supposed to do, if you do what I'm trying to explain to you in this parable, then you will receive your eternal dwellings. So... The problem presented in verse 8, the solution presented in, excuse me, the problem was presented in verse 8. The the solution to the problem from verse 8 that was given to us in verse 9 is that we need to provide for our eternal future and that we need to be shrewd enough to approach and handle the use of our worldly resources in whatever way we need to, that it's in service to the Lord so that we can secure our eternal dwelling place. Matthew 16, 19, this is a verse where we talk about, um, I've heard this, this verse all my life. It says that we're to store up for ourselves riches in heaven. So the idea here being that you're using your your resources shrewdly here from a spiritual standpoint, not from the world, but from a spiritual standpoint, you're going to secure your, your future dwelling place. So where your treasure is, your heart is going to be also, Matthew 6, 21. Um, If your treasure is, is in heaven, then your mind will be set on spiritual things And if your heart is set on serving the Lord, then you're going to be paying attention to all of those little things in your life. Sorry, I'm getting ahead. This is the incentive. Sorry. So verse 10 through 12. So problem in verse 8, solution in verse 9, incentive in verse verses 10 and 12. So this is where Jesus is saying this is this is why this is why you want to do what you're doing. So he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. He who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, he's talking about the wealth again that he just referred to as unrighteous, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? All right, so we're going to look at a few of these parts quickly. Um... He who is faithful in little things, also faithful in much. Um, so, 
What is Jesus referring to here when he says little things, being faithful in a little thing and also being faithful in much? The concept here, the idea here, I think is that all of those, the, what we call, none, nothing is little when it involves your spirituality. But the little things that, that I think about are uh, being completely honest when you're put in a tough situation. Not telling a white lie. Um, you know, the, the little things that we do. Well, if your heart is in a place where when you're presented with those little situations or the small things that you act in a righteous manner, that's going to project into the bigger things in your life, right? When you're, when you're, I've heard people say before uh, to a new Christian, you know, work on this, work on this, focus on these little things. And before you know it, you focused on these little things, you know, several years down the road, you've accomplished this, this big thing, right? You're, you're taking care of your life in the whole spiritual, your whole spiritual matter, because you've, you've taken care of all these little things. So if you don't, the, the, the opposite of that is if you don't take care of all those little things and you're not righteous and focused on those, those things, then obviously the big picture is also going to be failing also, right? Because you don't have a good foundation. You don't have the, uh, you don't have the foundation. You're just not building into that, that bigger thing. So if you're faithful in the little things, then that's going to make you faithful in, in all, you know, in everything, in the bigger things, then, then you've made the mark. So you've accomplished your bigger goal of being a good and faithful servant. Matthew 6, 21, I'm just talking about here, um, trying to illustrate that obviously Matthew 6, 21 is talking about laying up your treasures in heaven, not here on earth, but the concept being that you're spiritually minded, your heart is set on, on spiritual things, not physical things. Okay, verse 11, um, he says, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? So the therefore, obviously, what is that there for? Um, he's saying, if you haven't been faithful in the use of this money, then who will entrust true riches to you? So Matthew, again, same verse. We're talking about storing up for yourself treasures in heaven. Um, so if you're not faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? So what I wanted to talk about quickly here is we think of our possessions, everything that's ours, and i got to be careful how I say this, but we think about what we have as being ours, right? Like how many people in here are homeowners? Probably a lot of us own our house or whatever. Okay, so you think that is yours, right? The house is yours. But is it, is it really your house? Most likely, like in our case, we bought a house that had belonged to someone else, right? So it hasn't been ours. We haven't owned it the entire time. We're just temporarily owning it. And once we're gone, or if we sell it or whatever, somebody else is going to own it, right? So it's kind of a, there's a concept of ownership, but technically we don't truly own it. It's not something that we own and we own it forever. It's just a little piece in time. Um, now, I will say that based on what we see in the Bible, um, Oh, I'm drawing a blank on their name. Uh, the, the folks that sold their land and lied about how much money they had taken. Ananias and Sapphira. Thank you. Um, they do say there, you know, when, when Peter's talking to them, he says, was it the land not yours? What is not, was it not in your possession? And once you sold it, were you not in control of that money? So my point is just that everything is from God. We're put in charge of it. But technically, it's not truly ours forever. And I'm not saying that very eloquently, but the point is everything here is temporary. It's just it's not truly something that we own. Everything we have comes from and belongs to God. We're just stewards of it. So the heart of the matter is this in verse 13. The reason Jesus has said all these things, the reason for the warnings in 10 through 12, the reason for the incentive, everything boils down to verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve uh, God and wealth. So a couple of quick things here, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, 
You cannot serve God and mammon or God and wealth. So, number one, look at the relationship between the master and the manager. The manager's role was to serve the master and take care of the resources that were left in his charge. The whole parable starts because the manager was caught squandering away his master's possessions because he had been overcome with greed or for whatever reason. Um, So he becomes a servant of the master's possessions instead of his master. Now notice Jesus didn't say that you may be able to serve God in wealth. You could, you you should, excuse me. He says you can't, it is impossible is the point here. It is impossible to serve God and wealth. There's a struggle that every single one of us is going to face over and over and over in our lives. And it's something that is not unique to just one or two people. I think every single one of us is going to deal with this or is going to struggle with this. So we're promised over and over and over in the Bible that we're going to be rewarded with riches. The Bible talks about mansions, streets of gold, the presence of the Most High God. We're We're going to be awarded these riches if we act in a certain way. And a lot of times, not only do we refuse to use our money in a way that in service to the Lord, we try to treat it differently, you know, our health, our homes, our time, our money. Um, But we think somehow that we can we cannot use our resources this way and still somehow remain righteous or remain okay. And I I think that's, that's one of the biggest warnings that's being made here. It's easy to make excuses like you can't afford it or you got bills to pay when you're talking about meeting somebody's needs or helping the church or whatever it is that the ways that you can use your money, Um, you know, let the rich people take care of it, whatever it is, but it's easy to get caught up in losing sight that we are just stewards and according to what uh, what we're being told here we need to really be careful how we manage what's been left in our charge the riches that have been left in our charge so one thing we learn here is that Jesus is telling us in the parable that the way we use our resources in this very short time that we have while we're here is going to directly affect our own inheritance So by using our resources here on earth to serve God and provide for needs of others, we are providing for ourselves in the eternal age to come. So we need to not just be thinking about our physical needs, but also our spiritual needs. And I'm going to close with this. So listen again to what Jesus says. You cannot serve God and mammon. Who is at fault for squandering away what had been entrusted to them in the parable? And we know that who of us in here is going to be at fault if we squander away what's been entrusted to us? Who was in control of the situation in the parable? Who was the the manager? Who was in control of the situation in the parable? Who is in control of our own situation, our own resources? Who is in control of that? If we squander that away, is it going to be anybody else's fault? We're in control of our own situation. Who made the conscious choice in the parable to use the riches left in their charge to serve themselves? Who of us will make the conscious choice to use the riches left in our charge to serve ourselves? One more time, listen to what Jesus says. You cannot serve God and mammon. You will love one and fail to serve the other. If you are going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you must make a choice which you will serve. We're very physical people, and we live in a very physical world. We're we're bombarded by this every day. Satan will use whatever tool he can to pull our attention away from serving God. And in my opinion, and based on what Jesus is saying in this parable, Riches or mammon is one of the best weapons he has in his arsenal. This is something that we all are affected by every single day. And it doesn't just have to be money. It can be power, riches, fame, recognition, whatever it is. But these are the things that Satan is going to use to distract us from what we need to be doing. Every single day I see, you know, TV, radio, um, our culture, everything, our schools. And even in my own home, I've been guilty of 
reinforcing with my kids that they need a good education so you can get a good job, so you can be successful. It's just everything we think about is money. But being successful does not... Don't let our culture brainwash us into forgetting that being successful is not just being financially successful. That is not the key. We need to make a choice that our definition of success will be to serve God and to keep him at the center of our lives every single day. I know I wasn't eloquent with the last part of that. I ran out of time. I apologize. I'm more than happy to clarify some of that. We are out of time. Um, In fact, we're a couple of minutes late. Next week, we're going to talk about the parable, or excuse me, the rich man and Lazarus, and um, we'll start into that second class. So thank you very much.